Very good. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about ultra high speed transportation systems. So this is technology that we're designing uh, in Toronto uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the government of uh, France and Italy. Uh, so this is a made in Canada technology that I'm going to share where we're going to be uh, rebuilding uh, transportation, uh, future types of transportation. Uh, and we're working, for example, uh, in the Toronto context too. So this is a very big example of uh, city building. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about, I'll show you the technology. Um, and uh, it's, it's really amazing because uh, uh, my, my background, uh, you know, years earlier, doing, uh, designing parts of aircraft, uh, aerospace, and, uh, and electric vehicles. Um, but I'm just astounded by now, with this project, the appetite for new transportation solutions that combat climate change and move people much, much faster, but also connect in innovative ways uh, within cities, too. Uh, and so, uh, that's uh, pretty uh, interesting, and it's, it's it really with this holistic design that we're doing, um, because many of us here are designing, designers, uh, designing, um, you know, the, a, a better world or a better, uh, better cities. Um, and so what I'm really going to, the main point that I'm going to share is also about holistic design. So not just a technology in isolation and not just a, a business financial uh, planning in isolation and not human-centered design in isolation, but a holistic design that goes together and creates an interesting solution. And, um, and, uh, and so this is what it is. So if you've heard of Hyperloop before, this, what we're doing right now is the next step beyond Hyperloop. And so we're designing uh, aerospace vehicles for ground transportation at over 1,000 kilometers per hour. So this is the, the transpod system, the transpod vehicles. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a Made in Canada uh, next set of innovations. But what's the basic idea? Um, so we have uh, a vehicle there, and it travels inside a tube uh, at extremely high speeds. And it's able to do that because of lower air resistance, um, because we evacuate most of the air pressure from outside of that, from in the tube, using vacuum pumps. Uh, so it overcomes air resistance that you would normally find in high-speed rail. High-speed rail usually goes, it's, it's, it's a few hundred kilometers per hour, and this is about three times as fast. It's also faster than uh, aircraft travel. So this is a very large project that we're working on out of uh, Toronto, um, and we're bringing this uh, to uh, other cities around the world. So it's, it's, uh, it's a multi-year project, um, and, uh, and, and really, actually, um, the whole concept of tube transportation, it's not a new concept, it's been around for about 100 years so far. Um, so 100 years ago, uh, two people, a Russian professor, Boris Weinberg, proposed this concept, and also uh, one of the pioneers of, of rocket design, Robert Goddard, uh, in, in, uh, in North America, uh, proposed. But that was 100 years ago. It was only incrementally worked on, it was still a concept, uh, for ultra high speed transportation, but over the years it was gradually improved. Uh, in uh, Switzerland, there was a project, uh, Swiss Metro. Uh, there were other projects uh, gradually improving the technology, but there were still major hurdles to solve. Um, Elon Musk uh, came up with a different word for an old concept. Uh, so sometimes we call him our, our marketing manager, uh, so from the, from the US, but it, he's not really working on it directly. Um, and so it takes somebody to actually do this on a full scale, full scale development, and that's what we're doing uh, in Toronto. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a very interesting project because it's partly uh, partly engineering, partly finance, partly urban design, architecture. Uh, there's a very good architecture firm in France that we're working with, uh, and uh, city planners as well. So. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting project. And over the history of it, um, again, it about 100 years of development. Um, and, uh, and so the basic concept for quite a while, but vacuum pump technology to reduce that air pressure in tubes has gradually improved over decades. Um, but even up until 
um, I would say even up until 2013, 2014, even though there was a lot of um, interest in the media, at that point yet, there was still no proper city building practical design that really accounted for this as a, a, a transportation system that was operationally feasible, um, uh, like a high-speed rail, like subway, uh, like uh, light rail, and so on. So, so there's a, a large amount of practical wisdom that we have to gain from the railway industry, as well as the airline industry, uh, to really merge aerospace and rail together and make this a long-term success. And so, so that's what we're uh, doing in, in Toronto. Um, and so uh, th this, is, this is the vehicle. It looks a little bit like an aircraft fuselage. Uh, very, it's, it's almost, I, you could almost think of it as a spacecraft that's built like a plane and it operates like a train. So it's with magnetic propulsion and uh, rows of seating inside. So this is a, a passenger vehicle um, with uh, about 27 uh, passengers inside. Doors on each side, uh, electromagnetic propulsion. So it's completely uh, uh, clean energy, uh, electrically propelled. But we have some special technology, that, that's this made in Canada te technology, to really make it competitive uh, now that we're working with infrastructure companies uh, to, to uh, uh, designing uh, um, uh, business models for this to be installed uh, worldwide, um, you really have to make it competitive with high-speed rail. So not only is it f uh, about three times as fast as high-speed rail, but also about the same price. So if you look at the proposals um, for uh, right now in Ontario, uh, from Toronto to London and beyond, uh, that's, that's a, tr a very traditional a high-speed rail proposal, uh, and we have quite a few alternatives to that. Um, and also one of our key designs, uh, we're working on that Toronto to Montreal uh, route, uh, and also in Alberta, this is just in the Canadian context, we're also uh, working with in uh, other countries, um, so especially uh, our work in, the, in Europe, uh, and also potential in the Middle East, uh, Asia, and Australia, the west coast of Australia, or the east coast of Australia. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, designing for the long term includes very key safety designs, uh, and so certification. Uh, we have, um, we have. Well, first of all, we've been uh, we've been meeting with uh, Trudeau in Canada, uh, Macron, uh, the president of France, uh, to really push this ahead in uh, Canada and France. Uh, we're also working with the Italian government. And so we have a lot of research and development going on uh, in Italy, too. Um, so it's a, it's a very, big, very big process. But why are we doing this? Well, um, just the real underlying philosophy. Uh, and so all of you are, are really interested in designing cities of the future. Um, and so we have some major hurdles to overcome, uh, partly with traffic congestion, so it, Toronto is a, a good example of that, but also climate change, uh, because uh, this is the projected temperature increase over the next 100 years from NASA. Because all of the work that we've been trying to do uh, addressing climate change, we still have this future, uh, even after all of the work that we've already done. And why is that? Well, uh, you, re you can actually track the energy use worldwide. So worldwide, we have uh, energy from fossil fuels and renewables, but still, after all the work that we've done, a large amount of our energy comes from non-renewables. And you see that on the side there. Why is that? Well, a lot of those non-renewables are needed for transportation. And in transportation, we use those, for example, in jets. When you fly on an aircraft, it actually needs a very energy-dense fuel, so jet aviation fuel, to, uh, to, to power the aircraft. And that's going to be the same way for a long time to come with jets. Uh, and so uh, cars, we still need asphalt for the roads. Um, so it's, it's, it's really we're, we're trying to look at fundamental differences. Uh, so aircraft, you know, one thing that's interesting is every time you fly on a jet, so imagine uh, a, a, a transatlantic flight. So when you pay for your ticket and you get in your seat, the pollution that you cause, 
just you from your seat is equivalent to leaving the light switch on in your house 500,000 times. So every time we uh, try to turn, remember to turn off the lights, remember you have to do that 500,000 times in a row for one hour uh, to, to make up for the pollution that you've caused for your one light. Uh, and so we really have to think big about transportation. We really have to think about fundamentals of vehicles themselves. Because fundamentals, a rocket, for example, a rocket has to lift its own fuel. And so does a jet. A car has air resistance. So we need completely new type of vehicles. We need to think about not just an incremental improvement, but a fundamental improvement in vehicles themselves. And that's why we're designing the TransPod system. Uh, so this is uh, not only for ultra high speed convenience, but also uh, to uh, be fully electric, uh, linked to the grid uh, for its own power that is transmitted to the vehicles for propulsion. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a renewable system uh, and also providing a convenient alternative uh, for people. And actually, um, What's interesting, uh, I didn't mention yet, uh, we're in the middle of, uh, part of our work with France is that we're developing a test track uh, design that we're uh, uh, preparing the zoning for in France. So a three kilometer long test track for the TransPod vehicle. Uh, so that's one project we're working on right now. So this is Canadian technology that's uh, spreading to uh, France as well. And to do this, you have to have very key industrial partners uh, so we're working, the, one of those uh, uh, is, uh, is actually in Italy. They actually worked on the International Space Station and the Mars Curiosity rover. Uh, so they're very good to, to work with. Uh, also two uh, 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 train companies. So they're very experienced with safety certification and also an uh, aircraft manufacturer. Uh, so really all these merge under one roof. Uh, with what we're doing. Uh, and that, this is actually a bit of a, a, an old list because uh, so, so uh, government partners uh, and, and private sector. Uh, so to give you an example, where is this? I'm not sure if anyone can recognize, but this is actually in uh, Toronto uh, and we're actually not far from it. Uh, so the Portlands area, which is uh, obviously a very large scale new development, uh, especially uh, the East Harbor neighborhood area. Uh, and so uh, it's already in the works for the, the relief line that's being planned, which links to a, uh, a, a Metrolinx slash smart track station that's being planned. And so the developer has been working with us on adding a transpod station as one of the Toronto stations that we're developing. Uh, and so this is, so it's a multimodal transit hub, and this is from a great distance, um, but uh, inside, actually, I'll, it's easier if I show you the video to, there we go. Okay, so I don't think we have the uh, audio, but uh, so you're just gonna get an overhead perspective uh, of this new station. It's, it's, a, it's a very large new development and an office space. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a large sense of um, the, the, the passenger traffic that's going to be required there. Um, and so uh, linking with, with uh, very neighborhood oriented transit, but also long distance transit is, is really key. Um, but also providing the right amount of space for, uh, for the zoning. And actually, this was, uh, a lot of this work uh, was designed in-house by uh, our, our specific design, but also with uh, an architecture firm that did a pretty interesting uh, station layout inside. Um, but we have to be very innovative on all fronts, so partly the passenger experience. This is very different than going to an airport, for example. Uh, it's much more like a European rail experience, so you buy your ticket, and you, uh, uh, when you feel like going, and you wait a few minutes for the next transport vehicle to arrive. And so it's, uh, it's actually multi-level, so the, 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 the subway, uh, the, the relief line is going to go underground, um, and uh, the, the, the Metrolinx uh, tracks are already there, and so this, this is actually above that level, above the, the GO train uh, level, or smart track. 
um, and so ticket pur purchasing areas. You can see you can see little reminiscent parts that, that would might you remind reminds you half of an airport and half of uh, a train station. And so that that hybrid allows us to have uh, express vehicles uh, that go uh, completely just to uh, Montreal, but also local vehicles that have more local stops uh, like Kingston and Ottawa. And as the vehicles pull up, uh, there's a bit of a, uh, a, a Spanish solution uh, style uh, unloading and loading of passengers. Um, there's a bit of a docking procedure. Um, and then passengers walk on board who have their ticket. You're kind of, um, that's the Spanish solution there. Um, and people are ushered in with, um, uh, according to the block of seats that they've purchased. And so it accelerates, it actually goes through first uh, an airlock and then it goes into the high speed zone uh, once it's going uh, uh, outside of the, the GTA area. So we actually have the ability to have local connections uh, inside of Toronto. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting designing this. And so high level, I mean, part of the reason why uh, the, 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 the government is interested uh, is that so it's partly for individual people, like all of us want to have a service like this, um, but also satisfying high-level government objectives. So, so reducing fossil fuel uh, consumption, carbon emissions, and even, um, and even when a, a jet ascends to altitude, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, when, when you fly on a jet and it's ascending, it uses up most of its fuel in that first phase when you're going up to altitude and then relatively less fuel on a jet. And so if you have two cities that are fairly close together, uh, and the jet is basically going up and down again. So there's a huge amount of fuel wasted in these short haul flights. So it's especially those distances, uh, for example, Toronto to Montreal, and there are many cities, city pairs around the world that have that short haul flight uh, problem where you have many flights uh, and a lot of waste. Um, so basically aircraft going back and forth. Uh, and, and also high-speed delivery of, of goods. I'll get back to that later. It's immune to weather and storms uh, because it's in a protected environment. But you also have to think about human needs. So not only government objectives uh, overall, but wh why would one person want to take this as their trip? As, as a po so we're drawing partly from the auto market people who would otherwise drive on highways between uh, Calgary and Edmonton on Highway uh, 2, and, or to Toronto, Montreal, or Windsor, and so on. Um, so it has to, be, uh, has to have speed, convenience, and price. So, so obviously the speed uh, is, is very, and by the way, uh, the sensation, what we're actually designing is a very smooth ride. Um, and it's similar to when you're on a jet and you're on the runway, so the jet accelerates, so you f your body feels a little bit pressed into your seat, so it's, it's the same amount of acceleration as on a jet like that, except just longer time. So it accelerates gently uh, when it is after it's le left the station, and just for a longer time until it gets to that extremely high speed, uh, over 1,000 kilometers per hour that we're designing these vehicles for. Um, but also convenience. You know, see how I've, I've, I've put a, a cross, an X through uh, the, the aircraft experience, so the, 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 the airline experience, because right now, when we buy a flight ticket, so imagine what you have to do. You have to uh, buy your ticket weeks, days in advance or, or weeks in advance for a specific time, and you have to show up at the station in advance, but you have to show up for that exact time. You, it's, it's not easy to just change it on a whim or whatever you want to do that day. Uh, so, so you show up to the station or to the airport earlier. Uh, you still have to check in. You might get bumped from your flight. Um, even if the aircraft takes off, if it's not canceled because of weather, it takes off. You still have to have turbulence concerns, so if there's a storm, the, air, the aircraft might get diverted to a different airport, you might lose your luggage. Uh, so there's a lot of unpredictability with aircraft flights, but also just the serendipity that we're designing for Transpod is, is it, it's a much more serendipitous experience, where if you suddenly decide you want to go to New York for the afternoon, you, you might be in the middle of your, uh, your work, 
and you want to visit somebody in New York for the afternoon, you go to the Transpod station, buy your ticket, wait a couple of minutes for the next Transpod vehicle to pull up. Uh, you get on board, go to the, enjoy New York for a few hours, and come back in time for dinner. So that's the serendipity. Uh, and the price, uh, with the passenger volumes we're looking at, and cargo, uh, we're, we're actually looking at ticket prices that are more similar to a, 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 a train ticket. So much, much less than an aircraft ticket. Uh, and so it's mass transportation, but it's, it's very fast. Um, and and, and how, how much energy conservation? I mean, jets are very inefficient, but even cars. Cars go the same distance, uh, but they're slower. And so you still end up using a similar amount of, of uh, energy. Uh, so, uh, and, and trains are, are a bit less, but the transport vehicle, since it's that much faster, with about the same efficiency, then it's much less energy used. And so overall, I mean, the, the social impact there, it's just improved work-life balance as well as the, the energy, the environmental side. Uh, so you can spend more time uh, at work or at home, uh, but also allowing people to, it, fundamentally changing how we uh, have cities set up uh, allowing people to more easily uh, either live very locally and or commute uh, because the, the housing prices are, are, are quite astronomical in Toronto and, and other uh, big cities and, and so allowing people to have a more seamless uh, connection with that automated technology um, that is computer controlled. It's far too fast for a human driver so it's all computer controlled with uh, fail, fail safe uh, redundant safety systems. So all that certification is, is important. And then just like when you build an aircraft, uh, so aircraft manufacturers, what they do is they actually have an open floor. So they sell to different airlines and then the airlines decide how they want to uh, lay out the seats. And so a similar thing here, um, where we have several different uh, seating configure, that, that one's actually an old one, uh, but, uh, but different seating configurations uh, that, that can be quite traditional and quite uh, innovative. And we have a very, uh, uh, in, a, in a few weeks, we'll, we'll be uh, showcasing uh, our new, uh, our new uh, design. Um, and so it's also for cargo. So, so cargo, um, <laughs> so, so I was, uh, uh, so we partly, car we talked with DHL, uh, FedEx, and so what's interesting is that there are 10,000 trucks per day on the highway, 401, so uh, between uh, Windsor and uh, Toronto, and so all those, those trucks crossing the Ambassador Bridge from Detroit, it's a huge amount of redundant uh, cargo traffic, and also the cargo carriers that uh, do uh, air freight, so they usually have one flight coming from the U.S. going to Toronto each day, and then they have another flight that hops over to Montreal from Toronto. And so they, uh, they have actually told us what they would be uh, interested in doing is just eliminating that flight each day from Toronto to Montreal. Uh, so, so when we can, tr we can actually transfer uh, cargo, just standard pallets onto uh, our car cargo vehicle. And so the cargo vehicles can interline with our passenger vehicles on the same route. Um, and actually what they told us was, uh, so the cargo carriers told us that uh, there's, they predict with the traffic that they're, the cargo traffic that they're seeing, uh, they are predicting that our line will actually be completely full of, on, on day one of cargo only, if we uh, filled that market. So we can fill our whole market completely to the brim, even without passengers. There's so much demand on that corridor between uh, Winds Detroit, Windsor, and Toronto, and Montreal, and Quebec City. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's very interesting, but also we were talking with, um, uh, we were talking with uh, vegetable growers down near the Windsor area where there's so much spoilage and it, it's, it's frustrating when you're a, a farmer or you're a, 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 a wholesaler and you have the shipment come in and, and there's so many rotten fruit that you have to get rid of, so you have to sort through everything and, and uh, it's, 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 it's reducing a couple of those hours of transportation have a, a very uh, big effect. Uh, so these are standard uh, kind of aircraft kind of uh, loading situations. Um, and so this, at the front of the vehicle, it actually looks like a jet engine, but it's, it's, it's not. It's an electrically driven compressor. It just helps, there's a tiny bit of air pressure that it helps get out of the way. Uh, so it's, and then inside there, it's like an aircraft bulkhead. It's bigger than you might think. Uh, but then there's 
in the in the whole uh, passenger area, it's uh, it's 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 just normally like a aircraft cabin, uh, and so then uh, the docking procedure and it's a twin tubes design, so like a train network uh, for both directions, uh, and we actually have an elevated and underground design uh, because when you have hills, so out in the country. Uh, the landscape varies, and so uh, it's, it's more cost-effective to be above ground. The tun tunnel boring is, is a bit more expensive. Um, but when you have hills, the radius of curvature, you can't just curve up or down or, or, or turn a corner suddenly. And so with those hills, we have to uh, uh, cut, cut and cover and sometimes tunnel bore in certain areas, but otherwise above ground. Uh, and so uh, magnetically driven engines and all the control systems, all the subsystems we're uh, working on with our industrial partners uh, and even the civil engineering. Uh, and so this picture is actually uh, in Alberta uh, because uh, we had a city council motion pass in Calgary already to begin the design of a, uh, a, a, a route between Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, and so it's another case where they have quite a few flights uh, and a lot of car traffic between those cities every day. And so it's, it's another place where there's a lot of um, need. Uh, and same with the, the, the test track, you know, in, in France, in Europe, it's amazing how uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of interest, you know, even more interest in Europe than in Canada. It, it's amazing how quickly things are going ahead in Europe, even though they already have very good rail network in Europe, um, but, uh, but, it's, but there's a lot of interest. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's speeding ahead that much faster. And, um, and actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, we were at a, a rail uh, innovation conference that, uh, in Berlin. 10,000, sorry, 100,000 people attend that conference every year. It's amazing. And, uh, and so the president of Via Rail was speaking there. And uh, there, I don't, there's nobody from Via Rail here, is there? Uh, but so, so it, obviously they do very good work at Via Rail. But it's interesting. His speech, he was he, when he was talking about innovation, he said at Via Rail in Canada we are putting Wi-Fi on the trains, and uh, and so the audience was kind of looking at each other and you know, is that is that what the best they're doing in Canada? <laughs> so 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 there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of rail innovation in Europe, and so we're really. Um, building on that, that level of innovation with uh, aerospace at the same time. And so in the Toronto context, um, th there's a lot of uh, needs, uh, not only between major cities, but also locally in Toronto. There's all of the congestion uh, that we're talking about and all of the desperate, desperate need for, for connections within the city. And so remember what I said, so the transport system, this is, this is beyond Hyperloop, this is a next generation and we, we have a special uh, technology to allow us to have local connections within a city. So we can actually uh, have uh, local connections when you have, so they're already uh, planning the relief line. Um, and so that's, that's the initial uh, station design, but we're also, uh, uh, th that's actually s supposed to be extendable to Union Station. So you have to start with an initial downtown station, but also stations uh, in the suburbs too. So uh, we were you know, hearing about uh, Markham too, and there's a lot of potential for uh, places like Scarborough and Markham, especially when there's work being done on, the, uh, on Smart Track and, and Regional Express Rail in Toronto. This is actually a very interesting alternative because when you have uh, high-speed vehicles that go to other cities, but you piggyback on that system to do local connections. So for people in Scarborough or, uh, or, or North York or Markham, to be able to connect downtown easily at a, at, a, at a low fare, kind of like a mass transportation system, a transit fare, but also uh, we've started talks with Pearson Airport uh, because they're doing that regional hub. And so there's, we're working out uh, a design to have a transport station at Pearson Airport too. So even if you're in Markham or, or Scarborough, being able to do the cross uh, uh, route across to Pearson Airport and then beyond to uh, the uh, Waterloo and London and Windsor. So, so this is a major connections that, that uh, can solve on a few fronts. 
And then when you do that, you think of the speed and you think of the passengers in each or, or the tons of freight, but then all of the vehicles. So this is all the people that do the serious train system design. You have to think about how to do that properly, the operations, just like a subway network or a rail network. Um, all of the, the, the vehicle spacing, the control systems, uh, the, the, the spare vehicles, the maintenance yards, and so on. So this is all part of the, uh, the design of all the vehicle throughput. So it's very high, f it's high frequency. It's unlike at an airport where you only have a, one plane to a city per day or maybe a couple. Uh, so this is many. This is, uh, so, so the express vehicles uh, uh, to major cities every 15 minutes, but also local vehicles more uh, frequently. So, so it's much more like a subway system. You just wait at the platform. Um, and then along the, the long distance route between out in the country, we, we really have to have uh, innovative designs for the infrastructure, for uh, safety systems, uh, and, and just like a, a subway network. So you have to have the proper uh, evacuation. Uh, so, so subways, you know, ab about every uh, 700 meters, you have emergency, uh, when it's underground, you have uh, exits. And so this is, this is similar, um, but it's, it's in a way, uh, compared to aircraft, you know, safety, I mean, obviously the, the safety certification process is what we're doing. We're actually, we got a, 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 a command or a, Mark Garneau, the Minister of Transport, uh, working with uh, the system that we're doing, so that he actually gave direction to, um, his, to the whole Ministry of Transport to begin a certification process for this kind of thing. And so, uh, and so we're really, the goal, what we're doing is starting with safety certification right from the beginning, baking the safety into the design rather than as an afterthought. So it has to be with multiple redundant safety fallback systems, and then obviously uh, uh, evacuation, and just the same as what you would have with a proper train system. But when you fly in a jet, uh, if there's something that goes wrong on the jet and you're at high altitude, what happens? It's not good. Um, and so typically, so if, uh, for example, if the aircraft depressurizes uh, and you're at 30,000, 35,000 feet, do you know what the pilots have to do? They can't just stay there. They actually have, it's part of their training, they have to immediately dive the aircraft suddenly down to about 10,000 feet so people can breathe. And then they can start to solve the problem. Um, and then even if there's other things, you know, it's, you're not on the ground right away. This is ground transportation. Uh, we basically we f uh, refill the tube pressure uh, immediately. If there's any problem, there's, all the vehicles are wirelessly uh, sending commands to each other. Uh, so if there's any error, uh, the, the system goes into stop mode. So the vehicles stop, uh, do emerg emergency braking, everything stops, and then the system refills. Uh, and then it can start again if everything's fine, or passengers can simply walk out to the exits, just like on a, a train system. Uh, so we have to be very innovative with the, the design and the, uh, the manufacturing. Um, and actually, this is an old rendering. Don't uh, pay attention to that one. But actually, oh, one other thing is whenever you see on our, uh, there's all the, the stuff in the, the media of what we're doing, and the ones with a clear, uh, it, it looks clear with the tube. That's actually just to let, for the rendering to let you see inside. Uh, but it's not actually clear. It's it's actually spiral welded steel construction. So uh, so just so you know. Um, but that helps people see. And so we're really looking at how to connect cities in an intelligent way when you have linear population density, uh, especially those intercity routes where it really makes sense. Um, and, and the route optimization, so, so we, we have computer algorithms that are doing the route calculations with all the mountains and everything, uh, but also the economic analysis. So you have, to be, you have to be really strategic with all of that at the same time. Um, and so it's, it's a very uh, detailed process, so the engineering and the, even the economics. Um, but then making it a very comfortable passenger experience too. So the people, it's really the people that matter. The, the consumers that, that pay for tickets. And oh, by the way, um, we're working with a special company that does optics to create artificial sunlight. So they have special optic lenses and a device that makes it appear as though the sun is uh, just like this. It's, it's, it's far up ahead, even though it's... So, so what we're, the point is to make it a comfortable experience and not claustrophobic. 
and even with video display walls, so you see the scenery going past uh, as, as you go at high speed. Uh, because that's, that's a lot, uh, it's more interactive, and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's hard for us to put glass everywhere, so, uh, so it, it's, it's much more interesting to do it this way. Um, and so our company is in Toronto, but we actually have uh, offices in uh, uh, Italy and France, um, and we're working uh, quite a bit uh, back and forth. <laughs> so um, we have uh, some large-scale project, the Test Track project and the industrial development uh, overseas and in Canada. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 big, the biggest concern is, is really making sure that um, Canada catches up, because one thing I'm worried about is, uh, is as the level of funding increases from Europe, more and more of this made in Canada technology is being brought, over, developed overseas. And Canada is losing out slowly. Toronto is losing out slowly. And this is, this is something I, I really worry about uh, day to day. But what happened was uh, we have, originally, we have our special, our secret sauce, make this really work well. Uh, so our, our, our patents and everything. And uh, what happened was our initial investors in, in uh, Italy, uh, we went over there and we had to, basically it turned into a big grilling session where they're looking at all of these things, the, 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 the physics, the, the city design, the, the, basically the proprietary way that we solve the physics to make the urban design work. Anyway, so they grilled us for hours, and uh, it was pretty uh, intimidating. But that was our initial, uh, they, they, they were interested in investing, and so they went away and uh, determined that uh, they wanted to go ahead and invest. And that was one of the largest angel investments in Canadian history, uh, based on this unique made in Canada design that's a next step beyond Hyperloop. So this is, that's why we call it TransPod. And, uh, and so we're really trying to make the next generation of transportation uh, here in Canada. And, uh, and in, in, a, in a sense, it's, it's, it's like the Canada Arm or the, the Candu reactors. It's Canadian technology that we want to really export globally so to have it, uh, the next big aerospace project like the Canadarm uh, that's recognized around the world and Canadians are proud of. Uh, and so this is, this is really a big change. And, and you look at, you look at uh, if you can see those lines, those are aircraft flights. So this, I'll just end on this and we'll have some questions. Um, but uh, but uh, one of the interesting things, there's so many flights around the world and we're not trying to replace all aircraft flights, uh, because across the oceans, we'll always need, we'll still need aircraft to go across the oceans. It's not practical to build tubes there. Um, some people in the, in the media have been speculating about, oh, is that possible? But it's, it's not practical. But it's really the short haul flights, and it's really about making mass transportation the smart way. And I think, I think uh, in, in, in Toronto, we, uh, we kind of get mass transportation, um, and, and there's, we try to, um, at Transpod, we're, we're trying to kind of ignore what's going on down in the U.S. There's a lot of um, uh, hype or, or activity about some of the Hyperloop work, but, uh, but it really, trying to design it intelligently here, this is, this is the point for the long-term success. Uh, so that's, that's, our process is more trying to make an intermodal mass transit system, not just for uh, one car at a time to take little cars through uh, pods and whatever. This is trying to be a realistic mass transportation system, inspired by what we have in Toronto and going the next step beyond. Uh, so, so this is Transpod, and um, we have, uh, I don't have the Twitter on there, but anyway, so <laughs> the people might have questions, and, uh, and so thank you very much. <laughs> big, big round of applause for Ryan. What a fascinating concept. We do have time for some questions, and I'm sure there will be a lot. If, uh... We want to get someone out in the audience to run around. If you have a question for Ryan, raise your hand, and we'll have someone run to the back. There we go. Hi. Uh, this sounds amazing, but I'm wondering about uh, ecological impact. Uh, can you speak more to that? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, you know, one important thing that I forgot to... I always, there's, always, there's so many parts of this that I, I always miss one thing. But, uh, but one of the interesting parts about... If you compare it to high-speed rail, um, so, 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 that, so the one proposal of, of 
possibly high-speed rail, uh, traditional rail from Toronto to London. To make that work, uh, you have to, it, it can't go, like the faster it goes, it can't go on traditional uh, low-speed train tracks. They have to build new. And so that ends up cutting across farmland. So the process, and they're, in California, they're doing the new high-speed rail line. They, it's a huge amount of work to expropriate all that farmland. So what f farmers have to experience is their field cut at this, uh, this funny angle down the middle. And so it, it's, it's basically a slash and burn kind of system, even though uh, trains are environmentally friendly, but you have that huge impact. Uh, and so one of the parts of our design is that in the majority of it that's elevated, it's, it's up in the air and you only have those pillars that go kind of like um, uh, posts. And so the farmers can still dr drive their tractor underneath. Uh, if you're going through a forest, the impact is minimal. And so, uh, for example, when we work with um, uh, animal behavior specialists where they, they research edge effects uh, on different species. And so that uh, for different species of animals, they're afraid to go too close to the edge of a forest or a clear-cutted area. Uh, and same with certain uh, so animals and plants, uh, edges of forests. And so this is completely different because it's, 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 it's a much lower, it's got like a lighter footprint. Thank you. Wonderful. Another question. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a mic over to you. Anyone? Over here, sorry, yeah, right up front. I'm curious about what, if you were outside of the line, say you're the farmer and you're in your tractor, what does it sound like when the train goes by? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so when you have these vehicles in a near vacuum environment inside the tubes, um, the amount of, I mean, there's a tiny amount of air pressure, uh, but basically sound doesn't travel in space. And so with that tiny pressure, there's a tiny bit of sound, but it's, it's quite different than a train line going, or the, the Toronto subway, because it, the, the wheels are right on the, on the rails, so that huge rumbling effect. This is actually magnetically levitated off the bottom, so it's on a cushion of, of a magnetic field, so it's much quieter. Great, another question right here in the middle. Uh, when you were mentioning about um, using magnetic fields to power, I guess it's, you're using a magnetic field to power the motors to drive a turbine. Um, how are you getting the energy to power those turbines if you're not using batteries within the, like are there batteries within the pods or is it like a pressurized initial push and then it just sustains that or? Yeah, Describe that a bit more. Another good question. So, very good. So, so we actually have uh, an advanced high-speed power transmission that is uh, similar to on trains. They have the, the, the power pickup, or on front of subways, they have the, the shoe, the pickup shoe that picks up the power, uh, or, or, or more trains that have the pantograph overhead. Uh, so this is kind of like that inside the poo, but it's a... Uh, a very part of the main in Canada interesting physics is uh, making a new system like that that actually goes at extremely high speed, and so this is part of our special sauce. Um, and uh, and you look at um, uh, you look at some of those train tests in Europe. Every once in a while, they have like a, a super high speed train test that's maybe 500 kilometers per hour, but you can't really with a train you can't really do that. Um, Normally, they, they never, they don't put normal passengers in those trains. They just have uh, maybe two operators that are a little bit afraid, <laughs> um, but they, they do it uh, because the train isn't designed, the, the power pickup isn't designed, it, it wears out very badly at those speeds for tr normal trains. So this system, so, so that's why high-speed rail is more for, uh, you know, 300, 400, up, sometimes 400 kilometers per hour. It's, uh, but, so this is about three times as fast. Uh, with that special power transmission. So it's, it's, it's linked to the grid on the outside. Uh, and the solar panels you see, that actually, uh, it, helps, there's a, it helps generate an overall net power back to the grid. Um, but, uh, but then it, it uses the grid to stabilize. Fascinating. Um, uh, we have time for one more question over here, Nigel. Hi there, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us about your projections in reducing congestion. You talked about 42 um, trains per hour, 
or pods per hour. Uh, what's the impact to the congestion in the urban uh, corridor from, say, Toronto to Montreal? It really comes down to how much uh, how much we build out. The, so it's it's a very um, uh, reconfigurable system. Uh, you can have the basic version. So it depends on the amount of investment from governments or, or private sector, um, because the basic version is what I showed. Uh, but then there's also ex extensions where you actually add more tubes uh, as part of the the, the system. So you have, so especially when I was saying. Um, you know the, the the cargo traffic only, where it can be used, it, it can reduce truck truck traffic purely from cargo shipments. Uh, now we can also add extra tubes for the. They can be interlined with passengers on the same tube, like tubes. Uh, but you can also uh, add more tubes for increased capacity. So it really is uh, quite variable depending on the level of investment. Uh, and so, for example, uh, in Canada uh, and in Europe, we well, especially in Europe, there's there's quite a bit of that. That often comes from the the, the public sector. So, uh, and in Canada too, there's, there's maybe a, a, a public-private mix for each for lines like that. Uh, actually, so each of our city pair locations, just as a background, uh, we uh, it's 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 our own business case that we have, but we create the business case for a, a public-private partnership that builds the line. So there's a finance backer, uh, usually, and a, a government backer, and a con major construction firm, or, or multiple, and us. Um, and so uh, depending on the level of investment, so if it's public sector investment, they want to reduce uh, that congestion as much as possible. Uh, sometimes if it's private sector, like in the United States, uh, it's a bit more of a private sector mix, usually. Uh, and so then it depends on the level of investment from the private sector. Um, but, but either way, uh, uh, we actually have, for, for, uh, for uh, congestion, uh, if you go on our website, we have a detailed study of um, the, uh, the Windsor, Toronto, and Montreal corridor, and you can look at the levels of congestion impact there. Wonderful. Amazing, exciting. Ryan is someone who travels to Montreal quite regularly. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you so much. Give it up for Ryan Jensen, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And, and, and by the way, uh, if, you, if you want more information, uh, you're very welcome to, uh, the, uh, so transpod.com, but also on Twitter too. Uh, and we're, we're really, like we've, we've really eager to work with any of you, all of you for fresh ideas. Uh, get involved uh, because it's very multidisciplinary uh, and even working you know on government we're federally we're working but even on the city level uh, and new creative designs so very open to all of you